Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of ET Career Talks. I'm Neha Vashisht Mahajan from The Economic Times. Today's episode Navigating the Future Career Opportunities in Renewable Energy presented by EIT Inno Energy is all about diving deeper into the world of renewable energy and the career path in it. So without any further ado, let's get to it. Thanks to India's net zero commitments, the green jobs market in India has exploded. By the end of 2023, about 18.5 million green jobs took birth across industries. According to Team Lease, this number is expected to double by 2047. Upskilling to meet the new found demand in the green and renewable sector has already started, but it is yet to match up to the speed of job postings. The rapid industrial expansion outpaces curriculum updates in the colleges, resulting in a shortage of skilled talent. Most of the expertise that's needed to drive India's green transformation requires strong foundational STEM skills. With more Indians going abroad to study and upskill, looking to universities abroad might be essential to aid India's renewable transformation. In this session, we will delve into the dynamic landscape of sustainable energy and the promising career avenues it offers. Our speakers bring a wealth of experience to the discussion, along with providing valuable insights into the evolving energy sector. Our speakers include Mr. Salesh Lala, Chief Business Officer at NIIT MTS. With over two decades of experience at NIIT, Mr. Lala is a seasoned professional in managing outsourcing relationships. Our second speaker is Javier Arias. He is the Senior Marketing Manager at EIT Inno Energy. As the Senior Marketing Manager at EIT Inno Energy, Mr. Arias will provide an overview of the organization's global impact on the sustainable energy and renewable sector. And lastly, our alumni speaker, Arjun Gupta, he is the manager at RMI India. Arjun Gupta will share insights into the skills and knowledge gained during his time at EIT Inno Energy. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start our conversation for today. And as we know that we are going to talk about renewable energy sector globally and in India. My first question will be to you, Mr. Javier. Uh, let's talk about the generics of the energy sector. What is happening in the energy sector globally? Uh, what do you see? Uh, where is the job market going? And how do you see the change in the energy sector when, it, uh, when you compare it to the last few years? Yeah, so that is a very big question, to be honest. Uh, there's a lot to unravel there. I would say that you have to think that we started from the transition from fossil fuels to uh, more renewable and sustainable sources because of climate change, right? So we are... Uh, and all the countries are working on this to to stop climate change or to you know fight climate change. Now, Europe has been leading these for for many years now. For example, we were created back in 2010 with this mission, um, and over the years, Europe has invested uh, significantly in this transition. Right uh, nowadays, many other countries are also uh, taking this leap. India being one of them, where, with big plans from the government to invest in renewable energy, in electrical vehicles, and in other uh, measures to improve sustainability. And there's another factor, more recent uh, and unfortunate, that is the war, the offensive between uh, from Russia to Ukraine, that has also played uh, a role here. So um, because of this, Europe started to focus more on energy security. So. Mm -hmm making sure that there's energy self-sufficiency, that we're capable of generating our own uh, power uh, at home, and that also plays a role in accelerating the energy transition, right? Yeah. So what does this all mean? This all means a big change in the uh, employability market. There's uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs being created uh, in the sector for which uh, we need to train people. So we need to train talent. There's a uh, uh, many jobs that perhaps don't even exist today, that are going to exist in the next five years. Um, but also we need to reskill uh, a big portion of the labor market at the moment. And that's also why we are investing in education in different areas, from uh, training young talent to actually reskilling and upskilling uh, the workforce. Right. 
So uh, we spoke about the global factors. Now I want to talk about the uh, Indian scenario. And for that, my next question to you is, Mr. Selesh, uh, what is happening when it comes to the Indian energy transition? How is India transitioning when it comes to the energy sector? How big is the landscape? Uh, so like everything else, um, the the opportunity in India is absolutely immense. Um, from a couple of factors. Um, one is uh, India has been more aggressive in setting up aggressive goals uh, for uh, this transition compared to most other economies. So uh, a couple of things that have been set up are uh, a move to a net zero uh, emission by 2070. And in fact, more aggressive than that is by 2030, uh, India has, a, has an ambition to produce 50% of its energy through renewable sources. Okay. Those are very ambitious goals. And uh, where are we today? Um, I think from an uh, energy uh, emission standpoint, uh, India, if you look at that, is uh, perhaps, I think it's the third largest polluter when it comes to uh, the emission of um, hydrocarbons into the environment. But that's not the only story. Uh, if you look at the per capita emission, which is emissions per person, India is actually towards the bottom of the table. So uh, uh, the consumption of energy in India uh, per capita is uh, about one-tenth of what it is in the U.S. Is that changing? Yes. Uh, given the rapid growth of economy, uh, the rapid migration of people into the urban centers, there are something like 50 million new electricity connections that are being set up every year. Uh, in India. So the, the growth uh, and the need for energy is going to be massive on one side. On the other side, there are ambitious goals that the government uh, and the public policy has set up. Now, um, what is the opportunity? Uh, the, you know, on one side, we, we absolutely need to protect the planet. But it also, in the process, presents an unprecedented economic opportunity. The transition to green energy is uh, the fourth industrial revolution. The, the amount of uh, capital uh, investment that is going in across the world uh, into the sector is, is more than any other sector in the industry. So we are at a cusp, we are at a seminal moment. What we believe is that while there is a, a massive influx of uh, financial capital, uh, and again, these are capital-intensive industries. You have to set up big, big power plants and so on. Uh, so there is capital going in. The India For India, uh, the need is today something like $80 billion, or it could be an $80 billion market a year uh, in this sector, likely to go double in the next 10 to 15 years. So it's a, it's a massive opportunity from an economic standpoint. Uh, and even though, I mean, the, the final point I would say is that you can put as much financial capital as you like, but it is also fueled by human capital, which is, yeah. do we have the talent, do we have the skills to really drive, um, you know, this transition, or are we going to get left behind? But I think there's there's an immense opportunity because India has more aggressive goals. It, its economy is going faster than anybody else, and and we are a young rising country. So I think this is this is going to be a sunrise sector as well yeah. as a green sector going forward. Absolutely right. And in today's uh, session, we are also going to talk about how the budget mentioned the energy sector in India. Uh, the finance minister also talked a lot about the energy sector and how the government is planning to work for the energy sector. Uh, she mentioned about rooftop solarization also. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think I think the, the it is it is a multi-dimensional approach. Uh, so there are three sort of big dimension of this energy transition. One is around mobility, as we all know, and that's where this is all, um, it's all about electric vehicles, uh, electrification of vehicles, um, removal of fossil fuel. I think India has taken a pretty significant leap. Uh, the, the charging network uh, expansion in India uh, and in big Indian cities is actually uh, going at a more rapid clip in many other developed countries. So you can actually get to a charging point um, in you know, a few kilometers, uh, which yeah. is which is massive for the size and scale of India. I think the second uh, big factor is uh, residential energy, and that is all about photovoltaic, which is solar and wind. And and this is where, uh, you know, 
personal consumers need significant investment to install uh, such equipment uh, at their homes and government subsidies incentives are going to play a big role in reducing the need for the upfront capital investment. And then the third uh, element is the industrial sector where green hydrogen is going to play a big role in converting some of the biggest polluters which are which is the industrial sector, the cement plants, the fertilizer plants and so on. And I think green hydrogen is an opportunity for India not just servicing its local market but it can be a big export potential as well. You can export green hydrogen across the world and, and India can be a big exporter. Definitely. So, uh, we cannot talk about any sector without talking about education in that sector. So, my next question is to you, Arjun. What do you think is there for the engineering students and how is the job landscape? Yeah, so, uh, quick uh, you know, introduction about myself. I finished my engineering <clears throat> from Velour uh, in 2011. And I was looking for a job in the renewable energy sector. It was quite new. No one knew what renewable energy really is back then. And uh, finding a job then was impossible. I somehow landed something with a small startup back then. Uh, and now we are in, you know, like about 12, 12 years out. Uh, and uh, if you look at the data, we are currently uh, going to have about 20 million green jobs in India in the next coming years. And 30% of these jobs are in the renewable energy space. Uh, now talking about what kind of jobs exist in the market, I think renewable energy is a very interesting sector because it calls for uh, students from all backgrounds of engineering. So example, like you require electrical electronics engineers for like, you know, setting up solar and wind power plants. You require chemical engineers, for example, to put up batteries and to research a new battery. Batteries are a new big thing. As Teresa said, uh, green hydrogen is the next frontier for renewable energy. So you're going to need a lot more engineers to research on, on that uh, aspect as well. Uh, you, you need mechanical and civil engineers, uh, you know, on the same side as well. Uh, for setting up these massive plants. Looking at offshore wind, which is a brand new thing for India, um, quite quite a big thing in Europe. So we're just opening up that sector. So all streams of engineering has some sort of, you know, uh, relation to uh, renewable energy. And that's something you don't see in many sectors where you have like, you know, uh, such a uh, sort of large array of uh, professions required. Uh, I think beyond that, what is also happening is that renewable energy as a sector, uh, the demand for jobs is much higher than the supply in India which is a cause of concern, but also a good opportunity for any students watching this or any professional who wants to look for a career in this. I think data is showing that about, there's a 50% demand supply gap right now in India for renewable energy jobs. Now that's because at least back when I was studying, there was no real courses that were really tailored for renewable energy. And even now, I don't think there are actual courses like how EIT and Energy gave me specific courses, specific, you know, like curriculums that were designed and tailored to, you know, teach you about skills, about what is the design of a system, how do you really go about de deploying something of that nature. So I think uh, the, the landscape is wide. Uh, for example, myself, I went from uh, being an engineer to a project manager, uh, to focusing on the finance, and now I work on policy research. So it's also interesting that just because you're an engineer in um, you know, uh, renewable energy, you don't have to just be that. Uh, there are jobs in project management, in marketing, in sales, and finance. So it's a large landscape, but for anyone who is interested in spending literally a year, a, a lifetime in renewable energy, there's enough scope and opportunities to work on. All right. So that was a perspective from an ex-student who is now successfully working in the sector. Uh, now I want to talk to Mr. Telish about uh, what is the current landscape like? Uh, in the energy sector. With your experience, how do you see this current landscape going ahead? Well, as I said earlier, I think we are at a seminal moment from a skilling standpoint as well. Uh, we are at the, uh, at the initial stages of defining what it means to work in the sector. What are the different roles? What are the different job architectures? What are the, going to be the skilling needs four different roles. As I said, okay. this sector is emerging very rapidly. So when it when you look at education framework, you know, you look at you look at different levels of um, employment. You look at white collar, you look at senior white collar, and then you look at blue collar uh, workers across the spectrum. And there are going to be different approaches when it comes to skilling from that perspective. Uh, clearly the white collar and the senior white collar require you know, these are people who are going to come from engineering backgrounds, typically. These are not arts and liberal arts kinds of jobs. These are technical, um, you know, areas. Uh, 
mechanical, civil, electrical, electronic engineers are going to be deployed in, in designing power plants, in setting up battery manufacturing plants, in setting up green hydrogen plants, in distribution of energy, which is going to be another big, uh, storage of energy is going to be another big sector. So there's going to be that white collar where engineering graduates, engineering work streams are going to you know, need specialization. With the foundational knowledge of engineering, you then specialize into one or more sectors in green energy. So clearly, uh, technical high-end engineering jobs are going to be really lucrative and, and will require specialized studies. And not just education, the industry will have to play a big role in creating apprenticeship programs and opportunities mm -hmm. for, um, for these students to actually get more real-life skills. So I think that's at the top end of the pyramid. And then, you know, the much larger numbers are going to be in the sort of blue collar workspace, mm -hmm. which is, you know, installers uh, of um, photovoltaic uh, uh, solar equipment, mm -hmm. um, battery storage technicians, uh, battery storage experts. Yeah. These are, uh, you know, more trade kind of jobs. Um, they may not uh, need a full engineering degree, but you will need technical specialists to, to staff uh, at scale these, these massive opportunities. So it reminds me of you know, I mean, NIT has been uh, in the area of global talent development, and one of the things that we are known for is computer education. And we, we started computer education back in the 80s, where we were actually faced with a similar several moment. The, the, the country was, uh, you know, exploding in terms of adoption of computers, and the formal education system wasn't enough to create the number of people who were, who were trained in IT and programming and so on, and then IT stepped in, yeah. To, to create that talented scale. I think we're seeing a similar opportunity in the energy sector. All right. So uh, this was uh, about the Indian outlook. I want to take a global outlook as well. So Javier, uh, let's talk about EIT Inno Energy. Uh, how do you think EIT Inno Energy has uh, impacted the world of sustainable energy and the education in it? Right. So I believe it ha we've had a significant impact if you look at the, the historical data. So we were created back in 2010. So that's roughly 14 years ago uh, from a mandate coming from the European Union to accelerate the energy transition. So what does that mean exactly? So we actually invest in innovations, invest in startups, invest in projects related to sustainable energy. But we also train uh, the people that are needed to work in those sectors. In terms of investments, uh, currently we have a portfolio of around 200 uh, companies, startups and, and scale-ups. Um, but over the years, we have screened over 7,000 uh, projects uh, and supported around 500 of them. What does that mean today? Well, we estimate that by 2030, these innovations will save 2.1 gigatons of CO2 emissions. So that has, I believe, a significant impact. Uh, now on the side of, of training and talent, uh, we have uh, a master's programs that are currently running in partnership with uh, some of the best European technical universities, uh, who also run since the beginning of our inception. And we account for more than 2,000 uh, graduates of these programs, arguing amongst them, of course. Um, and also, most recently, of course, we've started collaborating with NIIT to skill, reskill and upskill the workforce. And we have now over 50,000 uh, learners uh, accounted for. All right. So, uh, as you mentioned, Arjun was also a part of EID in Energy. Arjun, uh, my next question to you is that how was your experience uh, when you were there at EID in Energy? And uh, anything specific you want to add that, you know, added value to your career yeah, yeah, in the sure. renewable energy sector? Yeah. So uh, when I started my first job in 2011 with uh, you know a small company that was doing you know rooftop solar for uh, rural villages in India, I realized that my knowledge and my skill set is quite limited, and um, I sensed that you know I really need to improve my skills and really uh, understand the subject a lot better, mm. and that's when I started looking for master's courses abroad, and um, it was very difficult back then to find anything across the globe to be honest. And then I came upon, you know, the select program, which was one of the, uh, you know, courses offered by EIT. And it was really interesting because I said I want to learn about the design of wind and solar systems. And they had exactly courses that, you know, were matching my requirements. And that to me was very interesting uh, because the fact that uh, these courses are very tailored to the requirements. The universities that offer these courses were specialized universities that had 
you know, curriculums that were designed specifically for what you required. They were cutting edge, they were advanced. Uh, the curriculum was very practical. A lot of project work was, you know, uh, embedded in them. So what that helped was that when I finished my master's uh, course, I had specific skills, which were very niche in nature. And when I went out to look for jobs right after my master's, <clears throat> my first job was in New York City, which to me was an amazing experience because I never imagined that after my master's in Europe, I would get a chance to work in the US. But, uh, you know, uh, when I look back, I realized that back then, and even now I feel, the, there is a need for these niche skills in clean tech and in renewable energy, which still do not exist. Imagine back then, uh, I had to fly across continents to go to the US because the US did not have sufficient manpower and specific skills to really help, you know, advance the clean tech goals there. And that's when, that's how my career started. So I think even today, I feel that, you know, there are very few courses that offer that, you know, specialization. Let's say if you want to focus on EVs, you don't have that over anywhere in the world or on batteries. I think EIT uh, has those courses and they, that really helps develop uh, niche skills that today's, you know, workforce requires. Like when we go out and hire right now, I don't see that, to be honest, you know, those specific skills. And it's a lot of, uh, pro, uh, like, work for organizations to skill and reskill, you know, like, uh, sort of uh, students and uh, uh, professionals because of the fact that uh, you want to have those skills already embedded at schools. And that's something that only EIT so far, in my opinion, has, you know, been able to offer. All right. So now this is about abroad. I want to talk about India uh, when it comes to energy education also. So Mr. Selish, um, NIIT, we know that is a market leader when it comes to education. Um, how does NIIT plans to contribute to uh, the energy sector and what is what is it doing when it comes to uh, fulfilling the demand in the energy sector? Right. So, uh... You know, this is a green field for us, but no pun intended. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is a very exciting sector for us. So uh, where we are today, NIT um, has a global footprint. Uh, so we are present in 40 countries around the world, driving uh, global talent development across different sectors. And about three years ago, we had started looking at uh, green energy or the transition to green energy being an opportunity purely from a business standpoint, not just as a contribution to the society, but from a business standpoint, it represents one of the biggest skilling opportunities. So we um, we started studying this sector about three years ago. And uh, about two years ago, um, we came across each other, you know, Energy and NIT found each other. Uh, Inno Energy uh, being sort of the, uh, you know, catalyst in Europe, uh, for driving both innovation as well as skills uh, to transition to green energy. Uh, by then, you know, energy had, had dipped uh, into education. Uh, so uh, they had uh, pioneered two things, which I think are absolutely spectacular. One is the master school, so master's program for, for high-end skills. And then also looking at not everybody can be a master's or, you know, when, when you're looking at employers, you know, if they need a thousand people, not everybody is going to be with a master's degree. So they're going to, you know, need people at different levels. And for that, you know, Energy has built some amazing trade education, which is highly technical around very specific niche skills around battery storage, around other areas in that. So we found that very exciting. And you know, we were looking for a partner who uh, has the the academic background, the subject matter expertise, and the and the voice in the in the industry. Uh, you know, Energy was looking for an education company who can take this globally, and and that's how we got together. And today, we are working with Inno Energy across all of these um, dimensions. So there is a partnership um, which we are. Uh, structuring around the master's program. So NIT has an NIT university, uh, which is a not-for-profit venture, uh, which uh, we are exploring how we can create something which is very unique uh, in India, where potentially it could be a hybrid master's, where some part of the program happens at NIT university, another part happens at a university in Europe, and, 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 and that talent can service the needs of the Indian market. So that's at the high end. But we also see a significant demand for uh, trained professionals in the battery storage, battery technician areas. And then Inno Energy is going to invest in building new curricula in areas like uh, solar and wind, as well as green hydrogen. So 
we are going to partner together to build cutting edge curricula, which is going to serve the needs of the customer. But it's not just India. We are also partnering with you know, Energy in the US very um, extensively, where there is a massive workforce development program that the, the American government, uh, with its Inflation Reduction Act, has clearly indicated massive investments. And there are just every month there are new uh, battery power plants and solar farms coming up in the US, again, which requires significant amount of talent. So at the workforce level, at the mid-level, and then at the master's level, I think there's an opportunity across all these th three sectors, and India is something that we're very actively looking at. All right. So uh, now coming to Javier. Uh, Javier, can you give us an overview of your uh, master's school talk, how it helps the students, what are the programs that you guys offer? Can, you, can we talk about that? Certainly. So we design programs that uh, respond to the needs of the industry because, of course, what we want is to accelerate the energy transition. That means that we have programs in different areas of sustainable energy, from uh, broader programs like sustainable energy systems to a more specific like smart electrical networks, but also renewable energy. And within these programs, uh, students can specialize in different topics. We even have a program in nuclear energy, which is also a very specific field. Also smart cities. So. Also smart cities, yeah. yes. So areas that uh, both Europe and also India are heavily investing on. Uh, so that's that's been developed over the years. Um, now, one of the key elements here is that we not only teach students technical skills, we believe that to make the energy transition and to drive innovation, uh, students also need more managerial, more entrepreneurial, more innovation uh, type of skills. So we teach students uh, these skills together with also business schools and accelerators and, and so on. So um, when you finish these programs, you're going to obtain, of course, technical knowledge, but also more business knowledge. And most recently, we've also incorporated elements of artificial intelligence and data science into the programs because we also see that one, as one of the fields in which more jobs will be created in the energy sector. We're talking about data analysts, we're talking about forecasting, uh, energy one consumption. Of the, one of the uh, programs I remember which we are partnering on is uh, data science for energy sector. Correct. Uh, which, is, yeah. which, is, which is currently a summer program yeah. in, in the university, but it's, getting a, it's, it's a six-week course, but it specializes the use of data science within the energy sector, which is, which is going to be Exactly. So yeah, again, Energy is really, really looking at cutting edge uh, areas within its overall portfolio. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, even the AI sector is a sunrise sector in yeah. India, and you guys are tapping that sunrise sector for the energy sector as well. So that is also a, a quite a great point That's when it correct. comes to education. Yeah, many of our graduates uh, work in that area. So therefore, we we realize that we need to equip them even more because those jobs are only going to grow in the near future. Absolutely right. So, uh, so Arjun, you were a part of EIT Inno Energy. I want to understand your experience yeah. at the master's school and uh, what would you recommend to the engineering students out there? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, to start off with, the, the uniqueness of the Inno Energy program is that, first of all, you get to choose the university that you want to go in based on specialization. So for example, I did my first year at KTH in Stockholm and my second year in UPC in Barcelona. Because the universities offered me the option that, okay, what do you want to specialize in? Okay, this school is good for this, so please choose this school and then go ahead and study those courses. It actually even allowed me to choose the courses I wanted to study, which was extremely good because that flexibility doesn't exist in many, you know, parts of the world. In India as well, like engineering of four years, very fixed curriculum. And mm. like, you know, you're very mechanical, you only do that for four years. Uh, what was interesting is that the courses themselves were not, like as Javier said, not focused on just engineering or like technical skills. Uh, we learned about energy economics. Uh, we learned about entrepreneurship. Uh, and that really helped us because at the end of the day, any sector today is not just, you know, about yeah. one particular skill. You have to have a multiple, you know, set of skills. Uh, what I enjoyed the most was that uh, there's a lot of project work happening. And we got to work with students from across the globe. Like we had projects where I had, you know, uh, my peers from different parts of Europe, some different parts of Asia as well. And initially, it was quite daunting because, you know, for the first time you leave India and you get to work with people from different backgrounds, different cultures, it can be challenging. But then the soft skills you develop are something that you carry on, you know, for your lifetime. So that really helped me because after I finished my master's program, I went on to work in multiple countries. And those soft skills really helped me understand and really grow uh, in my career really well. So that was one really in, uh, exciting, you know, uh, opportunity and, and a really good chance for me to grow myself as a professional. 
more than that, also what is happening now is that uh, I've, it's about 10 years now that I finished my master's program. Most of my peers from back then are working in some really good organizations in the top energy, you know, like companies of the world uh, right now. And what that's doing is that it's helping us build a really strong network. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is that if I want to collaborate with them in the future, or if any of them or myself is looking for future career prospects, we can just tap their shoulders and ask them that, hey, could you, we could you have a quick chat and talk about, you know, how to work on this together. So that's really helpful because at the end of the day, you know, as, as any good school will tell you, is that your alumni network is, is, is not worth its weight in gold. So that's something that we're really enjoying as well. A lot of our students are actually now uh, going and opening companies uh, in, in clean energy. So overall, I would say that EIT is almost helping us revolutionize the you know renewable sector overall. And we are essentially the, the ones who will take this sector forward. Definitely. And do you think that, uh, as you mentioned about uh, soft skills, yeah. do you think India requires in its education system yeah. Yeah. the mandate of uh, learning soft skills and networking yeah. uh, you know going forward i think yeah. a lot of work has been uh, already being done yeah. on that yeah. but do you think that it is uh, uh, necessary for the indian education sector so it's been 13 years that i haven't been a part of the education system so i don't know how it is right now but what i can tell you is that when i finished my graduation i don't even know what soft skills are like we thought that okay as long as you know your courses as long as you know your curriculum you're okay but once you sit for interviews, when you, when you go and talk to actual people in the industry, you realize that unless you can portray or really say your ideas out in a way that people understand and connect with you, it's, uh, you know, your hard skills or the really technical skills are not really very helpful at the moment. So I really, you know, hope that educators around India and across the globe as well uh, develop specific curriculums that not just teach you how to, you know, develop soft skills, but actually have practice in it. So for example, you actually go out and, you know, uh, have uh, practical experiences of being in networking events or uh, talking to recruiters, talking to, you know, companies, uh, so that those skills are not something you learn by books or rote learning. It's something you practice and you develop, you know, over a, a certain time frame. So I yeah, absolutely agree that it's a, it's a much uh, must. Uh, you know. I really wish we stopped calling them soft skills. I think they're, <laughs> uh, they're, yeah. they're vital skills, yeah, they're yeah, workforce and uh, workplace and leadership and professional yes, skills. So <laughs> there is Definitely. no such thing as soft skills. I think. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Mr. Selesh, what do you think NIIT is doing for, uh, you know, uh, solving this issue when it comes to the education sector? You know, as I said earlier, the uh, the ambition is to uh, address this issue of global talent development um, at a global level. So there are uh, two or three different dimensions uh, that we are looking at. Uh, and each one will have a different scale. If you may. So uh, at the highest end, we are, we are looking at a collaboration at the master's school, which will, which will be very select, which will have a handful of students because that's, that's really aimed at the pinnacle. Uh, at the second, at the lowermost level, we are looking at workforce development. And here, um, we, have, we have different approaches for different markets. So, for example, in the U.S., there is an extensive community college ecosystem. And these are two-year colleges, which are funded heavily by the government, which act actually act as catalysts for creating talent which works in the industry. Uh, so, uh, we are partnering with Inno Energy to take some of the flagship programs, like battery storage technician, which is, which is about a 65-hour program, or a battery storage expert, which is about a 120-hour program, and deploy them through the community college ecosystem, which are gearing up to produce. So let's say there's a battery manufacturing plant that gets set up in rural Georgia. There is the local community college who is given the mandate to develop talent who are going to work in that plant. And we are going to collaborate with a network of community colleges for workforce development. So the master school at the top, collaboration with local educational institutions at the trade school level. And then the middle tier is all about corporate training. Uh, there are you know, hundreds of thousands of, or millions of people across various industry sectors, of course, oil and energy, uh, oil and gas, energy, energy distribution, uh, mining. These are all sectors which employ lots of people who will need to get reskilled at different levels, depending upon what they do today and what they're going to do tomorrow. So we're launching a pretty significant corporate reskilling program as well. So we are involved in three levels, the master's school, the community college related workforce development, and in the corporate sector, looking at reskilling programs. 
Right. Across the board, I think we're talking about the millions of uh, employees, right? Absolutely. So the, the the numbers, the targets are huge. Uh, the opportunity is huge as well, and and we are leveraging uh, you know today's digital technology to reach people. So it's not everybody is going to come to a physical classroom. Yeah. In community co colleges, we are setting up labs and physical infrastructure. Corporate skilling is going to be almost hundred percent dig digital, using really advanced digital technologies. And I think the master school is a hybrid program as well. So we're leveraging state-of-the-art educational technology and pedagogical approaches to really hit the mark in terms of both skilling as well as achieving scale. All right. So, uh, Javier, I want to ask you, uh, when it comes to Indian students, uh, since energy sector is a sunrise sector right now, um, how do you think, how much interest is there when it comes to Indian students uh, uh, for the sector and the education in the sector? Yeah. There's definitely a very big interest and there has been since the beginning, so we're very proud of that. Um, and I think nowadays, because the government is investing so much in the sector as well, uh, there's a huge opportunity. So Indian students can, for example, come to Europe, learn about some of the best practices and like the lessons that Europe has learned in this energy transition process and perhaps come back and apply them here because they will see what has happened in the different areas, what has happened in Europe in terms of storage, in terms of solar, in terms of offshore wind, what you were saying, that's a big opportunity in India. Um, so you can go there, see it uh, very close, very closely, and perhaps come back and apply it here. Or perhaps also have the opportunity to work there, uh, gain some experience, and uh, years later come back here uh, in a higher position to, to make a bigger impact. So, uh, But we've seen cases like Arjun, of course, that are very now now very well positioned in industry, also students who are starting their own uh, companies because they see that opportunity. And that's also something that we support. So in our programs, we teach students entrepreneurship and we have different platforms in which they can develop their own companies so that they uh, get that exposure, whether they want to do it straight after graduation or perhaps five or 10 years down the line. Uh, we want them to, to come and change the system from, from within, let's say. And uh, I think for, for India students, that's a fantastic opportunity at the moment. Mr. Selesh, how do you think the collaboration between NIIT and EIT you know, Energy is going to impact the world of sustainable energy? So I think, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we find it, EIT you know, Energy to be sort of the fountainhead of knowledge, of innovation, of um, network of academics as well as industry uh, leaders. So, you know, energy has access to subject matter expertise from both the academic world as well as the industrial world. Uh, they are in a very unique position. They, as as you, uh, as Javier said, uh, they have been an investor in mm. more than 200 companies. Mm. Uh, some of them are the biggest gigafactories in the world, like Northvolt and Workor and others. And some of them are very innovative uh, tech startups and so on and, and everything in the middle. So, so their portfolio of companies gives them a, a very wide base of um, experts to tap into. And then their association with uh, universities give them, gives them a very strong academic footing. So between, as you put them together, there is that fountainhead of knowledge, of um, uh, innovation that, that the world needs. Uh, so, th so, so that's what comes from you know, energy. I think the other part is that you know energy plays a very significant role in shaping policy, uh, especially mm -hmm. in Europe, and then now more so in the U.S. as well. So U.S. is coming out with, for ex uh, Europe is coming out with the Net Zero Act, which a big component of that is going to be Net Zero Academies, which are mm -hmm. which are going to be significant initiatives uh, to upskill people across the value chain, and you know energy is going to get hopefully the mandate to, to drive and operate these net zero academies. So I think that's the, the, the immense capability that you know, energy brings to the table. NIIT uh, has the ability to deliver at scale. Um, so we, we are a true global talent development corporation. We have about 100 large clients of our own in the corporate sector, like the, the oil and gas sector and the mining sector who are hungry for these kinds of solutions. And we have the ability to, to really proliferate this, these, these curricula and these solutions through a variety of different channels that we are developing. So hmm. think of uh, you know, energy as sort of the fountainhead of knowledge and innovation and NIT as the scaling operating arm. 
to take this education to the world. And I think this is a very unique combination. Uh, we've not only created a partnership, which is, which is very ambitious, NIT has actually become an investor in EIT and Energy as well. In their second round, we, we just saw so much potential that, um, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're really uh, upping the game. So this is not just a regular partnership that you signed. NIT has actually taken a stake in EIT and Energy. We've invest, made an investment because we see this as a very strategic long term. All right. So uh, everything is ever changing in this world in today's time. Uh, Javier, how do you think the courses at your school are combating with the issue of trends? How do you keep up with the with the trends nowadays? Yeah, that's a that's a very straightforward answer, and it is by involving industry. So basically, our programs are created to respond to the needs of industry. So because we have these portfolio companies, but we also have investors like NAIT and other big players in the market. Um, we get them connected with our students, we get them involved in case studies, we get them involved in, uh, say, uh, internship projects and so on throughout the two years of the education so that we remain very relevant. To give you an example, um, our, our students in their second year, they attend a big uh, energy event in Europe where they work with some of our partners in solving some of the most uh, relevant and recent, let's say, uh, uh, cases that they face. And there we're talking about topics like AI and then cybersecurity in the energy sector, which is also becoming very important uh, with companies like Schneider Electric, for example. So with Schneider in particular, we've signed agreements in which they are uh, powering two of our programs related to electrification um, because they also need this talent. They are very hungry for talent and they really need people with these skills, not only the technical, but also what we're saying, the, the core skills, not to say the soft skills. Um, and that's how we make sure that the programs remain relevant. They're constantly receiving input from industry. All right. So uh, lastly, Arjun, um, how was your experience at Inno Energy and how your experience directly contributed to the experience you had in the renewable energy sector in India? Yeah, so I think talking about the sector in India, first of all, if you look at the recent news, like you're saying about the budget as well, right? Um, we need to do about one crore households with rooftop solar in the coming years, which is a yeah. massive target. Uh, number two, uh, as Mr. Sarish was saying, we want to do 50% of non-fossil fuel capacity, which is mostly solar, wind and hydro in the next six years, which means tripling of the existing capacity of solar, and wind, which is not no small task. Uh, another very uh, lesser known fact about India is that we are going to be the second biggest solar panel manufacturer in the world in the coming years, right after China. With some of the largest solar plants anywhere. In the world. Yes, and some of them are actually now expanding in the US as well. Yeah. So the sector overall is, you know, in India is about to explode, to be honest, uh, for me. And what I'm seeing is that, like my experience in the inner energy space, uh, was that having, um, you know, a background or education in the engineering of renewable energy is going to be vital. I'll tell you why. Because in my experience, when I learned about the science, about the engineering, about the design of these systems, I went from being an engineer to, you know, some, uh, to understanding uh, how projects are developed and then into the actual administration, legal, all of those aspects of the project. Today, I work in policy and it is the fundamentals of renewable energy that helped me, uh, that got me, uh, that I got at Inno Energy that gives me an edge because I understand the science behind it. I understand how these systems work. It really helps me understand the sector very well and design projects, design policy, design, you know, like how uh, overall the sector should be running, uh, thanks to my bottom-up, you know, uh, understanding of the sector. So I think that experience is invaluable. I would uh, really recommend students looking at the sector. Look at EIT if you really want to understand renewable energy from the bottom-up and if you want to spend a lifetime in the sector because there is immense potential. And it's only sort of, we are only scratching the surface right now. Uh, what also happens is that, like my experience was where I did my education in Europe and went to the US. So that, that is something that is very unique as well, where you essentially open up yourself to the world. It's not just one particular country or, you know, region that you are limited to. This is a global revolution right now. And uh, think. as things are, so you were saying that this is the fourth the big revolution in the world. Uh, it's something that you'll see happening in every part of the world. So you're basically becoming a global professional or at least beginning your journey as a professional by enrolling to a you know, master program like EIT. All 
All right. So it was quite a fruitful conversation, I must say. We got to know a lot about the renewable sector in general and the education sector as well. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today on ET Careers Talks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.